Once again, good evening and welcome to Fusion Fellowship, our midweek Bible study here at Calvary Chapel Hemet. To those of you who are tuned in live stream right now, uh, we want to welcome you uh, along with us. Uh, we're making our way through the book of Acts, and that's where we're going to be tonight. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to be picking it up where we left off last week. We almost made it through chapter 4, but we stopped at verse 31. So this evening we'll be picking it up in verse 32. And so really quick, just to get us oriented, we took a look last week um, at the prayer of the church. Uh, you may remember Peter and John had been arrested. Um, they stood before the Sanhedrin. And we learned that there was really nothing the Sanhedrin could do about it. And so that it didn't spread any further, they severely threatened um, Peter and, and uh, John not to speak anymore the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that obviously wasn't going to work for them uh, because the Lord had commanded his disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they did something we should all take note of, Rather than running away and hiding, they ran to the church, to their brothers and sisters in Christ. And the church came together in one accord, and they lifted their voice to God in prayer. Well, that prayer is what we took a look at last week, and what a great prayer it was. Probably one of the most interesting things about it was that their prayer, it, it wasn't to change God's will. It wasn't to change God's will. It wasn't to... Uh, take their problem away. Rather, it was to give them strength to endure through it. They didn't ask for the heavy load to be taken off their backs. Rather, they asked for stronger backs to carry it. And that's something we can all learn from as well. And so it was just a, a great prayer. I really enjoyed going through it with you guys. And now we'll go ahead and we'll pick it up Back where we left off, beginning in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, Dr. Luke tells us this. He says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And so the multitude, the multitude of those who believed, speaking of, of course, the church, the believers. Luke tells us something that I think is really neat here. He says that they were of one heart and one soul. The church is made up of many different types of people. We're males, females, all different shapes, sizes, and colors. We come from different backgrounds. We have different personalities. Some of us speak different languages. Some of us like to joke a lot. Some of us are more reserved. Some of us uh, are talkers. Some of us are quiet. Okay? And, and in that respect, we're different. But spiritually speaking, we're one in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, 
so also in Christ is Christ. Even though the church is made up of many different people with all those different things we mentioned earlier, spiritually speaking, the church is one body. We are one in Christ, and, and because of that, the church should be of one heart and one soul. And so we ask ourselves, okay, well, what is that one heart that we, the church, must have? Well, it's the heart of Christ, which we see so clearly in the scriptures. For example, we see God's heart in John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the world him he might through the world through him might be saved. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But that's the heart of Christ. That's the heart of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That none should perish but have everlasting life, and that through Jesus the world might be saved. Does the church have that heart? That no one be condemned but be saved through faith in Christ. That was Christ's heart to save lost souls, and to do the will of his Father. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. That was the heart of Christ. You see, for the church to be of one heart, one soul, or mind, it means to be like-minded with Jesus. That also would include our love for one another in the body of Christ. Jesus loves his church. And he gave himself for her, a selfless, sacrificial love. And so we must be like-minded, of one heart with Christ in our love for each other. John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that's what we see in verses 32 through 35 of our text we see love for one another being demonstrated. There are those out there who will claim that this was communism um, in the early church. I mean, it, it, it says all were who possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. Is that communism? Certainly not. Um, actually, when we get into our study a little later tonight, we will see that no one in the church, no one in the church was forced uh, to sell their land and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet. Rather, this was a voluntary thing. That's the difference with this and communism. Communism is taken with force. This was a voluntary, voluntary giving of what they had to help those in the body who were lacking. And we also have to keep in mind the context as well. Um, remember, back in the beginning of Acts, we learned that every able-bodied Jew was to make the pilgrimage from, from wherever they were to Jerusalem uh, to the feasts, you know? And that's when Pentecost happened. Many who accepted Christ when Peter gave his sermons, we told 5,000 people, many of those who accepted Christ were far from home. And the church was also under great persecution. And so there were great needs amongst the believers. Seeing those needs, many of the believers who possessed things like land sold their land, and they gave it to the apostles to distribute as needed throughout the church and distribute they did because again the needs were great remember the apostle Peter said to the lame man silver and gold I do not have why because there were great needs and as the money was laid at their feet they were good stewards and they distributed and took care of those who were lacking 
Oftentimes when we have an event come up, for example, the couple's retreat, sometimes the cost of that can, can be a bit much. Um, for example, a young couple who's just starting out, uh, you know, they may not be able to afford the cost. And, and so oftentimes we have like a scholarship um, where the church will pay for them to be able to go. That, that happened to me and my wife when we first started coming to this church many years ago. Um, there was a couple's retreat and it included a hotel with a view of the beach, you know, and, and so it was a little pricey for us. Well, my wife and I couldn't afford it at the time. But someone anonymously put an envelope in one of the agape boxes with our names written on it. And inside of that envelope was the money for the retreat, and it said couples retreat. There's been times where one of the members of the church has dropped off money right before Christmas, you know, anonymously, and asked that it go to someone with children so that they can give them a good Christmas. That's not communism. That was love. It's the same thing we're seeing in Acts. And that's what I want us to see more than anything in that group of verses. That they had such a love for one another in the church that those who could were willing to give out of their own to help their brothers and sisters in Christ. The haves helping the have-nots. It wasn't forced. They weren't commanded. It was a voluntary action. And in doing so, it was a demonstration of the type of love Christ said we need to have for one another in the body of Christ. Christ's love for his bride is a sacrificial love, and that's what these brothers and sisters in Acts were doing. They were sacrificing their land, which was a big deal in those days, and using the monies to build up the body of Christ. And that same thing still happens today. We're told in verse 33, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I love that. See, the church was operating the way it was supposed to. <laughs> there was a purity within the church. The apostles, full of great power of the Holy Spirit, were fulfilling their calling, we saw in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to be witnesses to Jesus. The members of the church were full of that agape love for each other. They were of one heart and one soul. And the result was God's great grace was upon them all. Not just grace, but the text says great grace. Do you want more of God's grace tonight? Then go sell your house. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you need to do that. <laughs> but for real, do you want God's grace? More of it? Be the witnesses you were called to be and love one another as Christ loved you. That's what we're told they were doing. Those two things. Preaching Christ, His resurrection, and having a willingness to help one another even if it costed them something to do so. And God's great grace was upon them all. Is there a willingness in our hearts to help one another in the body of Christ? There's a lot of ways to help each other besides financially selling your house or something. Sometimes people just need someone to listen and a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes that young man just needs an elder in the church to be an example of a godly man to him. Likewise with the ladies. Sometimes someone may need encouragement. Sometimes advice. 
that person that's always sitting by themselves, that's always quiet, might just need someone to go up and say hi. There's so many ways that we can demonstrate our love for one another in the body of Christ and help one another. And that in itself is a powerful witness. Well, speaking of a willingness to help one another, check out this guy in verse 36 with me. It says, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Mm. <clears throat> After seeing the unity of the Spirit in the church, being of one heart and one soul, and the willingness of the church to sacrifice to help one another, we're now introduced to and given an example of a man by the name of Joseph or Joseph. Joseph was given the nickname Barnabas by the apostles, and it's a cool name. It means son of encouragement. And that's what Barnabas was, a member of the early church who was known for encouraging the brethren. He hailed from Cyprus and was from the priestly tribe of Levi. He's mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts, six times in the epistles. And as we get further into the book of Acts, we'll see that Barnabas is a major character in this book. It was Barnabas who was Paul's companion when Paul was new to the ministry. Actually, Barnabas was the one who encouraged Paul and introduced him to the other apostles. It was Barnabas who took Paul to Antioch to participate in the outreach of the Gentiles. And it was Barnabas who stood up for and encouraged young John Mark when he failed. And the Apostle Paul didn't want to take him with him on their missionary trip. And so he's just a great man of God and an encouragement to the brethren. And we see there in verse 37, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the Apostle's feet. It was a voluntary thing that he did. He saw a need in the church, some who were lacking, and the Spirit put it on his heart. And he sold his land, gave it to the apostles to distribute to those who needed help. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, that's what Barnabas was. He was a cheerful giver. He decided in his heart to give the money from his land to the church for the needs of the people. But then we're immediately given another example, an example of a husband and a wife named Ananias and Sapphira. They certainly weren't cheerful givers. Interestingly, they were counted among the believers they were part of the church. And it's my opinion, they were in fact saved and had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. We can't say for sure, but it's entirely possible that they may even been part of that group in the upper room. Peter clearly knows them both by name. And we know the church had by this time grown to over 5,000 believers. Yet Peter knows him by name. And so for the remainder of our study tonight, we're going to be taking a look at their story. A tragic story, really. 
You see, after seeing Barnabas, the son of encouragement, sell his land and give it to the apostles, well, surely people would have noticed that. That's not why Barnabas gave the money, not to be noticed by men or for being so spiritual. But surely people, including the apostles, would have commended him for his good deed. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted a piece of that. They wanted the glory of being a cheerful giver, even though they weren't. They wanted the glory of great sacrifice for the church. The glory of being a super saint. <laughs> and so what did they do? Well, they pretended to do what Barnabas did. We're told in verse 1 of chapter 5 that Ananias and his wife sold a possession. Well, a possession? What, what, what was the possession? What was the land that they owned? Luke reveals that to us in verse 3. So they sold their land, and what did they do with the money? Verse 2, he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, he got this certain amount of money, stashed a chunk of it away, and brought what he had to the church and gave the illusion that they were giving every cent of what they had gained for that land. They were giving it all to the church. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. And so a few things to take note of in that verse. One is that Satan was at work here. Satan was at work. And he was at work using a Christian to attack the church. to destroy the purity of the church. Remember, the church was of one heart, one soul, helping each other out, loving each other the way Christ commanded, and then boom, here comes the leaven. Satan had filled Ananias' heart. Does that mean he possessed Ananias? No. But he certainly tempted and influenced him. It's a win-win, Ananias. You not only get some cash out of this, but man, everyone will give you the same glory as Barnabas. The church will never know. Everyone will think you and your wife are so holy and spiritual. Tempting the flesh. He tempted him with pride, money, glory, which is foolish, really, because whenever we give or do a good deed, it is God who the glory belongs to all the time. It never goes to the saint. It goes to God. Well, Ananias caved, and his wife was equally as guilty. She not only was aware of this deceit, but she herself lied when confronted about it. But it's interesting because we're told who they really lied to. Peter said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to God. By the way, this shows us that the Holy Spirit is a person and that he is, in fact, God. Take that to the J-dubs. You can't lie to a thing. You can only lie to a person. In this case, they lied to the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Take a look at this verse 4. Speaking of the land, Peter asks him, While it remained, was it not your own? 
And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. That verse right there blows the idea of communism out of the water. If people would only keep reading. <laughs> Peter says, before you sold the land, wasn't it yours? It was yours. Yours to keep, yours to sell, yours to do what you wanted to. And even after it was sold, Ananias, the money you got from it, it was in your control. It was yours to do whatever you want. Again, the selling of the land and giving to the church was voluntary, not forced. But look at that last part. You've not lied to men, but to God. Not only did we see the Holy Spirit's a person, but this verse also shows us the Holy Spirit is God. He didn't lie to us, he lied to God. Verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. And so did Peter pronounce a death sentence upon Ananias? No, not at all. He never said that. Peter simply exposed his sin. It was God's divine judgment that came down upon Ananias, and it was severe. He dropped dead. Dropped dead right there. And that shows us the seriousness of sin. It's an example of how sin leads to death. Not only can it lead to physical death, but it leads to spiritual death. That's why Christ willing went to a cross. And thank the Lord for that. And it's easy for us to look down our pointed noses at Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> How could they? Sinners. <laughs> but let's look at what they're actually guilty of. I'd like to read to you a quote from Warren Wearsby. He says, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira was that they put on a lovely front in order to conceal a shabby sin in their lives, a sin that cost them their lives. They put on a lovely front in order to conceal a shabby sin in their life. You see, they were being hypocrites. They put on the mask. That's what the word hypocrite means. It means to put on a mask. And the mask that they wore was one of being holy and spiritual, when in reality, they weren't. I'm always leery of people who carry themselves and, and speak as if they're the most spiritual person in the world. I, I'm leery of that. It's like, you ask them a simple question like, Hey, man, how's your day going? And, you know, they're like, oh, praise be to God, brother. And, you know, I just woke up and felt the Lord's presence in my breath. And it's like, oh, so you're having a good day then? You know, it's like, cool, man. You know, like, come on, dude. <laughs> I'm leery of that, you know. I, I'm just leery of that. It's just me. But their sin was lying to appear more spiritual than they were. And in doing so, they didn't lie to man, they lied to God. I heard the question asked, if God was to strike down everyone in the church today for this same sin, how many church members would be left standing? And so before we drop the hammer on Ananias and Sapphira, we should first look at our own lives. It's always good to do that, do that self-examination. How many of us live a life different than we portray at church? Speaking of the church as a whole, there's many brothers and sisters that portray themselves as God-fearing Christians, but have no problem 
getting hammered drunk on the weekends, messing around on their spouse, you know, getting stoned. There's Christians who portray themselves to be spiritual men and women of God while they're around other Christians on Sundays. But if they had a pet parrot in their house, well, they probably wouldn't want you around that bird <laughs> for fear that it's going to repeat something that it heard in their home. How many would be left standing? What Ananias and his wife did was sin done in secret. But Peter, we see the gift of discernment being exercised there, knew what they had done already. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 4, that the Lord sees what's done in secret. That goes for both good deeds and sin. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us, and when we sin, it grieves him. Sure, Ananias could fool those around him into thinking he and his wife were the most godly couple in the church. But God sees all things. Amen. And God knows all things. And he's the one we need to be concerned about. The Bible also says that your sin will find you out. And it did. Let's take a look at our last few verses this evening. Beginning in verse 7. It says, Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And so we see the wife, she's just as guilty as the husband here. She had a chance to repent, as we all do. When Peter held up the money and said, hey, your husband said this is what you got for the land. Is this what you got for it? She had a choice to make. And she made the wrong one. And the text says they agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. In the wilderness, Jesus was tempted by Satan. You guys know the story. The Bible says the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, but something kind of cool is in the Greek, it means that the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Over and over, Jesus withstood Satan's attacks by reaching into the Old Testament, pulled his sword out, and quoted scripture. And one of those scriptures was out of Deuteronomy 6.16, and he told the devil, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And Ananias and Sapphira tested the spirit of the Lord by deliberately sinning against God. Either they thought God couldn't see what they were doing, which is foolish, or they were presuming upon God's grace. Either way, they tempted the Lord, and we see that they were dealt with. God made an example to the church then and the church today that God does not tolerate deceit in his church. His son, our Lord, shed his blood for the church, and Jesus loves his bride. And so just a lot of lessons we can take home from this tragic story of Ananias and Sapphira. In closing tonight, I want to point out one last thing. 
Are there Ananiases and Sapphiras in the church today? You bet there is. They're in every church all over the world. And although they may fool those around them, putting on a front, playing the hypocrite, God sees and knows everything they're doing. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I hope they do that. This is the third time we've seen the church under attack by Satan in the book of Acts. The first is when the disciples were speaking in tongues the wonderful works of God. And there were mark mockers in the crowd trying to convince people, I nah, don't listen to them, they're just drunk. The second attack came from the religious leaders when they arrested and severely threatened the disciples not to speak in the name of Jesus. Those were attacks from outside the church. Well, those didn't work. So what did Satan do? He launched attack from within the church. But again, we see Satan fail as they were found out and judged by God. Third attack on the church and third failure. God's great grace was upon them all. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said this about his church. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. And so, Father God, we come before you.